So what I've kind of take from Final Fantasy, or so I've come to know about it, is that uh, it's a thing. <laughs> uh, as in, you see it almost every year. In fact, according to a wiki page I was looking at one time, apparently they get a game about every year. So uh, yeah, you pretty much can't escape it. And uh, <laughs> so it's been really interested in me because I used to see it all the time. Not even used to, I still see Final Fantasy stuff all the time and I just can't get away from it. So needless to say, it's really taken my attention and you know, it's just really curious to see people talk about it, how they feel about it, you know, but I'm always, I was always just kind of sitting to the wayside and just kind of, you know, just looking at it. And I, I actually did play a Final Fantasy game back in the day. I can't even tell you really when I did it, but at some point I ended up playing Final Fantasy 12 on the PS2. I think it was 12 anyway, <laughs> it, it just goes to show how long it was ago when I originally played the game and I thought it was like okay I knew I played a Final Fantasy game at some point before this video I guarantee you that well actually no that's a lie because uh I did play Final Fantasy 3 back in 2016 before deciding that I wanted to play the first game first and then waited like three years to actually do it <laughs> almost three years anyway to uh actually get around to playing the first game but pre Final Fantasy 3 I did play a Final Fantasy game before that and I want to say it was 12 I I'm almost Sure, it was 12. So, this wasn't really so much back then. This is more of a recent thing. I've been gotten over this feeling, though, and this kind of started when I started talking to this this really cool guy called uh, Keon012. You probably know him from my podcast and a couple of out loud thinking videos that we've done. Uh, yeah, he likes Final Fantasy, and I didn't really start thinking about the series that much, at least not paying it that much attention anyway, until he started talking about his interest in it. And how he had played all these games and his time with it and how much he enjoys it. I don't even really, I don't even really remember how we even got on the subject of Final Fantasy. It might have been through some of the Final Fantasy Monster Hunter for Ultimate DLC. But I'm not really sure. I can't confirm that. But one thing's for sure, for some reason I kind of didn't like the presence of Final Fantasy at that time. For some reason I kind of saw it a little bit as a rival to the Legend of Zelda series. Even though that's weird because Final Fantasy doesn't really have much of anything to do with the Legend of Zelda franchise to begin with. So yeah, that was a bit of a strange sort of rivalry I had towards the Final Fantasy series. It was really, really strange. I'm not even really sure why I had the attitude that I did towards the Final Fantasy series. Because, I mean, it's another adventure-related franchise, but I mean, that's about as close as it gets to Zelda. It seems, even with the later games when they take on the more action-oriented JRPG approach, and granted, I haven't gotten to that point yet, but it still doesn't look like Zelda. Zelda still has its own flow, if you will. So, that being said, the reason why I've decided to get into the series is... It's nothing deeper, or really anything like that. Truth be told, I'm running out of Zelda games to play. Especially in the last few years, I've been seriously indulging myself on Zelda video games. And getting through a whole lot of them. In fact, I only have one single player game left. And that's Link's Awakening. And the only reason why I haven't played it yet. Is because I have this really bad habit. Of when I get close to finishing something I really really like. I start to seriously slow down and indulge in myself within it. Because I don't want it to end. I'm doing the exact same thing with JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Because I'm hitting a point where I know I'll have to sit and wait for issues to come out and I don't want to get to that point because I love JoJo's Bizarre Adventure just that much that I don't want to stop and have to wait for it. So I'd rather, <laughs> I'm kind of like waiting for part eight to end just so I can <laughs> read it all the way through. And you know, the same thing will happen when part nine happens, if it happens that is. So yeah, it's just a weird habit that I have. So while I'm coping with this weird loss thing that I have going on with the Legend of Zelda series, I am Jumping over to Final Fantasy, because I know Final Fantasy is a huge, huge franchise. And in fact, uh, lo and behold, you know, I was looking up games, because I want to play through all of the games. And I'm over, like, 44, 45 games behind? Like, I didn't even realize just how massive this franchise was. Although I shouldn't be too surprised, since a game comes out about every year. So, it's not much of a shocker, but nonetheless, I was uh, quaking, if you will. So yeah, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about the uh, OG Final Fantasy. So recently, uh, unsurprisingly, I beat it, and it, it was quite a time. Uh, just keep in mind that this is the GBA version of Final Fantasy, 
uh, the Dawn of Souls version, which comes with 1 and 2, actually. Because, uh, I avoid NES JRPGs like The Plague. I just... It's not so much that I don't like them, they're just really good about getting on my nerves. And it especially soiled my attitude towards them with games like Earthbound Beginnings. I think that's like the one that everybody knows me, uh, knows me for when it comes to NES JRPGs is that one. And, uh, I just, um, no, I can't do it, man. I'm sorry. And when I saw that there was a GBA remake of the first game, I'm like, I might as well just go with that one because I know, not so much I know, but I just got a bad feeling that I'm going to be really bitter towards the NES version of it because uh, I'm already, uh, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not the biggest NES fan to begin with. I honestly think that the NES has a big library of games that have a lot of really dated and not very good philosophies. So I kind of view this GBA version as the uh, reinterpretation of the original game, which, well, it kind of is, actually. It's a remake, but you know what I'm going for here. So what? Uh, Final Fantasy. Let's get talking about that. So uh, let's just get something right off the rip right here. If I ever decide to look at more Final Fantasy games, they have no connection to each other, like whatsoever. 2 has nothing to do with 1, 3 has nothing to do with 2, etc, etc. Except for games that are explicitly a part of that numerically labeled game, such as Final Fantasy IV The After Years, or like, the 5 Final Fantasy VII games. So, just keep in mind that, you know, if I ever get further into this and you're like, wait, hold on a second, this is not what he was talking about last time, that's why, they don't have anything to do with each other. So, uh, yeah, the plot of Final Fantasy I. So, it's not very interesting, to be honest. In fact, it's really, really brief, and it's almost non-existent. But, the gist here is that the elements of the world are unbalanced, and it's not looking really good for all life in the world of Final Fantasy, it seems. So, everything sucks, and to make things worse, the fiends awaken, and they're just kind of terrorizing everything, and during all this chaos, Four heroes, four unnamed heroes, well, not until you name them at least, show up, each clust- each clust- Four of them show up, each clutching a crystal of some kind. And, uh, yeah, that's- that's kind of- that's kind of it, actually. And after that, you have some things like there's a traitor called Garland that kidnaps the king of Cornelia's- daughter and then you kill him and then bring him back or bring her back excuse me back to the castle to, t to the <laughs> so you kill garland you take princess sarah daughter of the king of cornelia back to the castle and the king is like all right cool let's build a bridge now because you saved my daughter and the plot just really just starts to not exist after that like it's pretty much just go here go there you know stuff like that it's not very interesting very intricate nothing like that it's Quite underwhelming, but that wasn't really the point. The point was that Square was a a dying company, and they were just trying to put something out. And I mean, hey, it turned out to be a hit, so you know that's pretty neat. But I'm sure I didn't need to tell you that. Not at all. So when you start the game, you get presented with a list of characters, four characters, and you can pick some jobs for them, or classes if you will. So you start off with the fighter, one of my favorite ones, because he's just a tank, he just hits hard. He can use just about every item in the game, and he's pretty dang good at using it at that. He's just good for putting out a lot of damage and taking a lot of damage, although his defense really, really sucks against magic, so, uh, yeah, he's not the end-all, be-all. But now that I think about it, I don't know if my fighter died a single time throughout my entire run. So, yeah, the fighter's pretty cool. You get to a point, and this is for all classes, where you kind of get to upgrade all of them, and they get way better at what they do. And the fighter just gets more overpowered than that. It's it's just, it's insane. Guy's crazy. Now, I will say for this run, I did a fighter, a monk, a black mage, and a white mage. So I have not had any experience with the thief, nor the red mage. Which, the thief, from what I can see, you know, if you've ever played any JRPG with a thief character in it, they're typically really, really fast and really, really good at building up a lot of DPS, if you will. And also stealing stuff, of course. And the red mage seems like they're a balance between the white mage and the black mage. Kind of if you want a middle ground with magic. And yeah, that's all it really took from it. But, uh, you know, for me personally, you know, I've always been a really big offensive magic type kind of guy. So unsurprisingly, the black mage is my favorite character to uh, mess around with in this game. For this run, I called her uh, Stella. Well, at least that's what <laughs> the pre-made names had for her anyway. So I, I guess it's a girl. I mean, I, I guess. But one thing's for sure... Stella's awesome, but everybody kept trying to kill Stella, and I got really tired of that. Like, and her defense is kind of garbage, too, and her HP is not very high. 
So yeah, it's, it's really, really irritating to keep the black mage alive. As for the white mage, she's awesome. Uh, I think it's called Sarah. Yeah, her name's Sarah. She just does a bunch of, like, you know, white mage stuff. Like, you know, like, she banishes the undead enemies. She can heal the entire party. Cast Protector on them. Inviseria? Inviseria? I'm not sure what it's called, but it, it increases your evasion. Although I didn't really <laughs> use that ability until the end of the game. But that was with an item and not actually the magic ability. So, uh, rest in peace, inv whatever it's called. And as for the monk, I think I just didn't know how to actually use the monk because my monk had really, really low DPS and just awful damage. So my monk just became more of a specialist, just a character that could do things fast. So he was very, very underwhelming. At least when I played him. I'm pretty sure I just didn't know how to play the monk because I've been told by some people that the monk is a really good character, so I'm pretty sure I just didn't know what I was doing. I'm sure that was the case. The combat of this game is really very really straightforward. It's a good old turn-based JRPG. This isn't necessarily true, but it's kind of like if you played one, then you've played them all in a sense. But this one is about as traditional as you can get. I mean, it's the original Final Fantasy. It's sort of set the standard for turn-based JRPG, so don't expect much here. But I will say that what I have played around with in the combat, it's pretty fun. I mean, the only thing is, is that some of the classes are very, very one-note. Like the fighter, if you're not just beating everything to death, I mean, I don't know what you're doing, man. He's just, just attack. Just attack. I don't even really use my fighter for items. He is our uh, frontal assault. So he's the one that's always constantly getting his hands dirty. As for the monk, again, I don't think I knew how to use the monk, so I think we're just gonna try to ignore him and, uh, and I'll keep moving on. As for the black mage, now I've always had this weird playstyle when it comes to magic or specialist characters where I always bet on the ice ability. I don't know if anybody else can relate to this, but if there is an RPG and you have a character that can use ice abilities, I will almost always gravitate towards the ice abilities. And trust and behold, if you look at this footage that I recorded of the game, you can see that I really, really, really like the Blizzard series. And once I find out how to finally use magic items, I got the Black Robe, which lets you cast Lazara all the time with no magic penalty whatsoever. Of course, the magic characters are better at using this magic robe than the fighter characters. So you can't run around like a fighter that has almost zero experience with magic just casting Lazara all over the place and dealing all that damage. The Black Mage especially is the best when it comes to using this Black Robe because, well, she's the Black Mage. She knows what she's doing. As for the White Mage, man, if you aren't casting some tier of heal or protect all the time, I guess you're kind of doing it wrong. I mean, this comes from a guy who knew Jack Squad of how to play as the monk, but I mean, hey, I mean, take for that what you will. So the enemy roster is, I'm not gonna lie, it's a little lackluster. Aside from it being a bunch of really typical stuff, like trolls and goblins and, you know, some orcs. I mean, you get some pretty interesting ones in there, like this one enemy just kind of called Death, who's like baked out of his mind. So you get some pretty interesting ones like that, but then you just gotta, you know, you get like orc, goblin, Dark Knight, but what really hangs me up with it is the fact that enemies aren't very diverse in terms of how they approach the player. They're mostly just, they just kind of just cast one magic ability, and they just kind of call it a day. And occasionally just beat on my Black Mage because everyone likes to kill her. So, you know, there's that, but when they're not doing that, they're just kind of doing their one ability. Maybe two abilities, you know, once you start getting, you know, making ways through the game. So, yeah, it's a little lackluster. But they're still fun to fight nonetheless. I just don't really like when they show up in groups of nine or so. It's just really irritating. But again, I've got a black mage and I can have her cast, you know, Fyraga or Blizzaga and just call it a day or Thundaga and just call it a day. So the items are pretty fun to mess around with in this game. You get your straightforward potions, high potions, ether. My favorite items in the game are the ones that do special stuff like the healing staff or the healing helm where you can cast it. It's basically free magic abilities. And of course, again, magic characters are best at using these free magic abilities, but the fact that you still have those are pretty cool. Like the good old white robe, which casts, I, I think it's called Inviseria. I'm sorry, I'm too lazy to look at the name right now. Inviseria, which increases everyone's evasion, which you don't really need a magic character for that. Just kind of have anyone cast it. The good old black robe, which I started abusing once I found out how to use clothing items. The clothing items are really fun to play around with. It's really, really neat. I mean, it, it is kind of overpowered, I don't even lie. Like, it, you just kind of start running the game after a while with it. Especially when I found out that the Healing Staff and Healing Helm combo is really, really overpowered because that makes anyone able to cast heal. I think I even had one time where two characters casted heal 
via healing staff and healing helm and then i had my white mage also cast heal so that's three stacks of heal i did right there it's really really insane the towns in this game are really really good for expanding upon the gameplay mostly with giving your character special abilities either through magical items or getting magic itself for your mages or just you know getting equipment you know the standards such as potions ethers high potions they're pretty neat as for the towns themselves and just how they look i mean they're diverse enough I won't say that any of them are necessarily memorable, but I mean, they get the job done, I guess. You know, they're nice. The NPCs within the towns, though, are not very interesting. Now, I'm not gonna lie. I think Earthbound kind of set the bar pretty high for me because now a lot of NPC dialogue and other JRPGs are infinitely more boring. I know you can't really say infinitely there, but don't, don't worry about that, all right? The NPCs in... Final Fantasy 1 aren't very interesting, they just say your typical, you know, like, hey, go save the world or something like that, or, hey, everything sucks, you know? <laughs> or the good old, hey, uh, go to this place and, uh, go beat the fiend, I guess, you know? Just very uninteresting stuff. Again, Earthbound kind of set the bar pretty high for me because pretty much every character kind of had their own story going on at Earthbound in some sense or another. It wasn't necessarily deep, but it was interesting to read all the NPC dialogue. So basically what I'm saying is Final Fantasy's NPC dialogue kind of sucks, but that's not really new for JRPGs at all. Now, the difficulty is, without a doubt, the biggest flaw with this game, at least with this remake from what I've seen. I mean, there's the elephant in the room. The enemies are just so, so weak in this game. They go from doing damage that's pretty considerable and hurts quite a bit to, for the most part, dealing damage that is like a quarter of your health, not even a quarter of your health, really, sometimes. Except for freaking Stella, because everyone wants to kill her, and her defense is already garbage, but other than that, I mean, the enemy damage in that game is just lackluster. But juxtaposed to the game's combat, the pacing of the game is definitely NES levels of pacing at times. And by that I mean it can be a bit difficult to understand what to do sometimes. Because at its core, Final Fantasy 1, even through this remake, is still an NES game at heart, it really is. So you get plenty of, you know, those good old, why in the world would I do that, or why in the world would I look for that kind of situations, you know, the usual stuff that plagued a lot of NES games back in the day. Some of the notable examples are things like finding the airship for the first time, which is located in a southern desert, just kind of sitting there. There's a bunch of deserts in the game, by the way, so it can be a bit confusing at times. And granted, you can only go to so many deserts before you eventually run into the airship. And I'm sure there are some NPCs that talk about how to get the airship, but that's kind of my issue with a lot of NES games. You have to find something that doesn't look relevant, or go to something that doesn't look relevant, interact with it just to get the information that you need to go elsewhere. Which I understand people don't really like the whole hand-holding nature with games now with how the story will kind of give you the instructions. But at the same time, locking information or excluding that information to an NPC or an exclusive group of NPCs just so you'll know what to do next, I don't really like that. Especially when those NPCs look just like any other NPC. So the game can be a bit tedious at times. There's a couple of times throughout the recordings where I kind of run around for a little bit because I genuinely don't know where to go and I get confused and I'm just I'm going here I'm going there I'm checking every town so I talk to everyone and eventually I just kind of give up and hit up a walkthrough because again I missed that one NPC that I didn't think to speak to who gave me the information that I needed to go to the next place and I end up really really annoyed with the game but I understand you know it's still an NES game you know it's this is a remake of an NES game and Square Enix is trying to remake the game, not reboot it, so they can't tweak the game all that much because they're not trying to really mess with the original formula, the original material, which I understand that. So that really isn't the remake's fault, it's just kind of the original game's fault, it seems. Although the game does have the courtesy to automatically carry out some actions, because I'm sure, just like with any NES game back in the day with Final Fantasy 1 if you had to do something really really specific you had to go there and then like maybe go into your inventory and then bring out the item and then use it whereas in Final Fantasy 1 if you go to the relevant place characters would do the actions automatically let's say like you're going out to that desert and you have to use that what was it Floatium stone the stone to summon the airship and instead of you having to dig through your inventory and bring it out and then use it your character just brings it out and uses it so if you happen to be missing that information you'll do it anyway which is nice so I feel like there was some compensation there. Again, I have never played the original Final Fantasy. I never will play the original Final Fantasy. I just won't, so don't count on it. So I will remain in my blissful ignorance here and say that Final Fantasy 1 seemed to have fixed this issue a little bit by having characters automatically carry out actions. At least that's my theory, if you will. 
So let's uh let's go to something a little happier. So the aesthetics in this game are absolutely draw dropping, I will say. It kind of got to a point where I was really excited to just, you know, get through the game and see what else the game had to offer because it was just pleasant to look at, truth be told. It, it just looks nice. It just looks good. The uh, battle scenarios, they look awesome. The enemy sprites, they look amazing. The character sprites, simple, but they look nice. The dungeons look awesome. My all-time favorite dungeon aesthetic, actually, is the Flying Fortress. I love that one to death for some reason. It was a space station in the sky or I guess it was in the sky it's a weird it's weird because apparently it's supposed to be a space station but it still looks like you're within the earth's atmosphere maybe it's just like at the at the bridging point it beats me you know maybe it's just in between I have no idea but you know you're still close enough to where the clouds are like they're just below you that's what troubles me a little bit with it but that's besides the point the flying fortress is awesome I love it aesthetically I mean it's a whole lot of blue but it's cool. I think the best example of the sprite work and the art design and aesthetics is when it comes to the really big sprites like the bosses. The final boss and all the fiends. And then other up-close sprites like the crystals. It just looks nice, you know? This game is just very pleasing to look at. Nice and bright and colorful and fun. And, you know, the child inside of me loves polychromatic aesthetics. So this was right up my alley. I love this game's aesthetics and I love to look at it. It's awesome. Okay, so I've been waiting forever to say this, but the soundtrack in this game is an absolute banger. No exaggeration here, it's probably one of my favorite soundtracks of all time. Now I understand that this soundtrack is not completely original, because it is based on the PS1 remake soundtrack. Which, even then, the PS1 remake actually added some extra songs. So, it's cheating a little bit. You know, but regardless, I still really really like the GBA version soundtrack. In fact, I've always been a really, really big fan of Game Boy Advance soundtracks because they sound like advanced Super Nintendos to me, even despite the fuzziness of it, but I quickly get over that, and to me it just sounds like a slightly more believable, but still very gamey feeling, kind of like soundtrack if you get my gist here. I'm no uh, music expert, I mean, I play a saxophone, but as far as actually breaking down music, I can't do that, I'm sorry, I'm just, I don't possess the capacity for that, but I really like Game Boy Advance soundtracks, and personally, the more gamey and sort of like beepy feeling that the Game Boy Advance version has, kind of makes you prefer it over the PS1 soundtrack. Especially since the PS1 soundtrack was kind of going for more of a orchestrated take on it, but I've never been too big of a fan of orchestrated remixes in general because to me they try too hard to sound realistic, whereas the GBA tries to sound realistic but also still sound very video game-ish if that makes sense. So I really really enjoy it and prefer it. The finale of this game is pretty interesting. After you defeat the four fiends, you go back to the Chaos Shrine, where you originally defeated Garland. You end up going 2,000 years back in time, because you need to, uh, I guess, kind of get rid of the source of the fiends. Again, you just kind of go back in time. They don't really explain why. You just kind of go. And I will say that the enemies there are a bit tougher than your average enemies. It's a bit difficult to navigate, and it includes a boss rush. And it includes all the fiends before, but they're notably tougher. Although I do really enjoy it, it's lazy. It's one of the laziest things you could do in any video game. It's something that plagued 80s and 90s video games. I mean, there's a good reason why this trend just kind of died out after a while. It just kind of sucked. But nonetheless, I still had fun fighting all four bosses again. The uh, final boss itself, Chaos? This guy doesn't mess around. In fact, he actually got a little close to wiping up my party a couple times. Especially Stella and my monk. I, you know, I actually made a really, really dumb decision when I was playing through the game. For some reason, once I found out that I had to go back to the Chaos Shrine to go back in time to defeat the final boss, instead of going to a town, because I came fresh out of the Flying Fortress, and that place did beat me up a little bit, not too bad though. Instead of going back to a town, hitting up an inn, going to sleep, and then restocking the materials, getting new magic spells before I go into the final dungeon. I didn't do any of that. I beelined straight towards the final area. No joke. I just went straight towards it. No hesitation, no nothing. I just went straight for it. Keep in mind that the Flying Fortress kind of ate up some of my materials a bit because the Flying Fortress starts in the desert and eventually you go to the Flying Fortress. So it's sort of an extended dungeon, if you will. So it ate up some of my resources quite a bit. So instead of stocking up like any person with common sense would, I just went straight towards the final dungeon. No brains, no nothing. So it, it became really interesting because it turned out to be this race against my resources to the final boss, which made my experience with the past Chaos Temple, I'm sure more tense than others have experienced it. 
And eventually I got to a point where I ran out of potions, so I was just living off of my magic healing items, my healing staff and my healing helm. Due to my own idiocy, I ended up making the final dungeon difficult, but not because it was like natively difficult, but because I was just an idiot. <laughs> it was really, really interesting. So yeah, the final boss is pretty tough, doubly so because, again, I was lacking resources, so I had to uh, improv a little bit, get a little creative with it. And uh, after a while, after landing the smackdown on the boss, after he cast it, I believe it was Kiraja on itself. It's a really, really good healing spell, so he healed himself up 9,999 health points or hit points, which was annoying. But after getting past all that, unfortunately my, uh, my monk didn't make it. He was just, he was down for the cow and the boss died, so he didn't even see what happened. It's kind of messed up. But after that, you get sent to a splash screen. You don't even really get to see what happens. After that, although there, there is kind of an explanation for that. So, you see, the whole plot of this game, because they decided to just kind of do a bit of an exposition dump near the end of the game. So, this guy Garland, or Chaos as we better know him, he kind of locked the world of Final Fantasy into a time loop scheme. He would go into the future, and these Warriors of Light would show up, and if they ended up defeating Garland, fiends that he also brought with them to the future simply went back in time and found a past Garland, and then had that Garland just kind of like not go and wait a little bit so that time was overwritten. And then he went up again and it was kind of a thing where if he died, the Fiends just kind of like, okay, yeah, no. And then just went back in time and then brought him back to the future and just started it all over again. But apparently there was kind of this weird time paradox thing where the Heroes of Light died. I guess they couldn't go back in time to try to stop him. So the effort was never done, if that makes sense. And then the time loop scheme continues. See, this is the thing that I don't like about time travel stories, is that when you try to keep track of it, it just starts to not make sense anymore. I've never really been a big fan of it. Because things just, they don't make sense. Because every time you do something in the past, or even in the future sometimes, the rule set of the world gets redefined. So the plot of Final Fantasy 1 just kind of gets convoluted needlessly. Especially for a game that was not that focused on story to begin with. It's it's okay, you know, it's not very great. So yeah, the heroes end up creating an alternate future where the fiends were never sent to the present, nor was Garland. So nobody remembers their efforts. So it's a, a little sad, a little unfortunate. So they just kind of came from the past. It's like, yeah, we did a thing, but like nobody remembers Jack Squat. You never saved Princess Sarah. You never went to Mount Golg, or I guess you did, it just... Again, see- So, despite this though, I guess the legacy still got passed down, like they still had a legend that was created. It was just not as grand as it should have been, I guess, because reasons. I mean, I guess they just kind of came from the past like, hey, we saved the world, even though they had absolutely zero proof for it. So what, yeah, because of this time travel situation, the story kind of poorly explained. Also, just the way the game kind of communicates the story with you is uh, kind of confusing. I had to look up some forums just to figure out what exactly happened near the end of the game and what Garland was trying to do because my original interpretation of it, because I knew that Final Fantasy games, save for ones that are explicitly connected to a chronologically labeled game, aren't related to each other. So when I saw Garland's plan, when he was explaining it to the player, I thought that he was kind of the reason why Final Fantasy games weren't related to each other. Because he locked the world of Final Fantasy into this loop where monsters and chaos would always ensue. So that even if he dies, when the universe resets, a new Final Fantasy game would happen essentially. That's what I thought would happen, which honestly that would have been kind of cool actually. To sort of explain why every Final Fantasy game is linked but really not linked to each other. They really don't have anything to do with each other, they're in their own separate universes, which would have made sense, but unfortunately, the plot is nowhere near as cool, and to be honest, it's a lot suckier, and needlessly convoluted, so yeah, the ending of Final Fantasy 1 is not the greatest. So I guess this is the part where I give my final verdict on the game, you know? My whole thoughts, my unwanted opinions, at least I still think people don't want them, I guess. I don't know how it is now. Nobody uh, comments on my videos anymore, and my Discord channel is, uh, my server is just about dead, so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know anymore. I'm kind of left in the dark here. But overall, I did very much enjoy this game. Even though it had some faults here and there, some NES syndrome here and there, being way too easy most of the time, despite all of that, I still really enjoyed the game. I had a lot of fun with it, you know? It was just a nice, 
fun little game. Is it going to be one of the best games I've ever played? No, not at all. Not even close. For as fun of a game as it is, there's just very little meat to its bones, man. It's... It's a little dry at times, I can't even lie. I think the game really could have benefited from being a lot harder, you know, giving more substance, more rhyme, more reason to the actions that you take within combat and within exploration, but alas, it is what it is. At least, again, this might just be the GBA remake thing, because I heard that they did water down some things quite a bit in the GBA remake. I mean, the NES game could not have this problem at all, or the PSP or the PS1 version of the game you know again but I'll probably never play those versions of the game and you know despite the game's almost non-existent plot it still held my attention pretty good I can't lie you know opening up the sands so I could get the airship for the first time was kind of cool going back in time was pretty neat going in underwater was quite an experience for the first time it was really aesthetically pleasing surprisingly aesthetically pleasing like square just kind of went out of the way just to please the player, and I'm not gonna lie, it kinda worked, I mean, I, I was pleased anyway. And the game seemed like it's reasonably long, it took me about 14, 15 hours to beat the game, you know, which I think is just right, because I think with a game with this sheer amount of lack of, uh, substance, you really don't need to be any longer, you know? I will say that the replay value of this game is quite low, because again, there is a notable lack of meat to the game's bones, but that's not really a bad thing. I don't think that a game should be defined by its replay value. I think that it should be defined by whether or not it was a good game. Because some games, even if they are super good, if they're awesome, some just aren't as easy to come back to. And I think this game is pretty awesome. Not one of the best games I've ever played, no. I'm sure one of the future games will get that place. I don't see Final Fantasy 1 ever become one of the best games I've ever played. I just don't see it happening. But again, despite all that, it was still a really great game. Will I ever play it again? Maybe. You know, I don't really know about that, you know. It just seems like... From what I've seen from the sequels, they just seem like they understand it so much better than the first game does. They are mechanically more sophisticated, their stories are a lot better, and everything just makes a lot more sense. So I see Final Fantasy 1 kind of being a one-time thing. And who knows, maybe I'll come back to it, maybe I'll try the PSP remake or the PS1 remake, and maybe I'll try those stupid, stupid bonus dungeons that I try like once or twice and both times they utterly kick my butt because I get to the grind for those because the enemies there have s the bosses there actually not the enemies they have stupidly high defense and they have stupidly high offense and it just gets to my nerves and it just kills my drive because again I utterly loathe like I detest grinding in a turn-based RPG I hate it so I look forward to playing Final Fantasy 2 so I've heard some pretty mixed things about this. I mean, I heard that some, from some people it's kind of good, from some it's it, they're mixed about it, and for other people the game just sucks, you know, it's just not very good. But hey, I mean I guess I'll find out for myself uh, soon enough. 